Welcome and thank you for spending this Sunday afternoon with us for Stories from the South, archiving your family history. My name is Lila Grace Pandy, and I'm the Culture and Arts Education Coordinator at the Asian American Resource Center, also known as the AARC. For those who are new and maybe this is your first AARC event, welcome. We are a community founded cultural center with the city of Austin and we are part of the Park and Recreations Museum and Cultural Programs Division. Since opening in 2013, we have served the local community by providing enriching programs and events such as our senior meals and meals and wellness program supporting local artists and creatives through our exhibits program, hosting large scale events and festivals, and also our education program for youths and adults. Currently our site is closed to the public due to COVID-19, but we are continuing to create community online through events and programs such as this one today. To stay up to date on our events and programs, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter. I'll be dropping a few useful links in the chat as well. Today, you will spend the first half of our event with a talk featuring both local and national voices on history and archiving, followed by a workshop led by the Austin History Center. We encourage all of you to participate today. Please note that our Zoom is not in a webinar format. Please stay muted, but we encourage you to engage with us via chat. There will be moments throughout this event for Q&A. As you may have noticed, this event is currently being recorded. We will share the recording of this event and any resources shared by the participants in the follow-up email to all registrants. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Aisha Khan of the Austin History Center. Anna Shaw and the whole AARC programming team for their support in putting together this event. And of course, to all of our incredible panelists who are lending their expertise and time this afternoon. I stumbled into the field of archiving out of frustration when I struggled to see biracial South Asian families like mine reflected in our country's archives and histories. So discovering and delving into the work of our panelists has been inspiring and healing for me, both personally and as a community archivist. So I feel so lucky to have you all in the same virtual space. As Lila Grace mentioned, I'm the Asian Pacific American Community Archivist at the Austin History Center, uh, which is the historic division of the Austin Public Library and the official archive for the city of Austin. Since 2000, our community archives program has been working collaboratively and alongside Black, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander community members to collect, preserve, provide access to, and advocate for our histories from communities of color in Austin. So the services that I provide as a community archivist are varied and community responsive and can range from conducting oral histories, providing reference assistance, designing exhibits and educational programming like this, um, as well as supporting Asian families and organizations in the preservations of their histories. So whether they wanna donate material to an institution like the History Center or gain the resources and skills to archive for themselves. If there's any ways I can support you or your community's history after this event, please do not hesitate to contact me or you can learn more about the History Center at austinhistorycenter.org. Finally, my work here wouldn't be possible without the support of my team at the History Center. And so I'm excited to announce that we have several History Center archivists that are helping monitor the chat so and they can answer any questions that you may have about your own family archives. We have curator of manuscripts, Molly Holtz, digital archivist, Nikki Kohler, as well as my dear colleague and Latinx community archivist, Marina Islas, who will now lead us in an indigenous land acknowledgement. Thank you, Aisha. Um, so again, my name is Marina Islats. Uh, I am the Latinx Community Archivist at the Austin History Center, and I welcome you all this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I, I wanna take a moment 
now to acknowledge that the land that the Austin History Center, the Asian American Resource Center, uh, and the George Washington Carver Museum sits on in Texas is actually unceded land that once <laughs> that once was the, the territory of several indigenous groups, including the Kwawitekan, the Numanu, Kwelkajen, Nde, Tonkawa, and Jumanos. Uh, these indigenous tribes were in this area long before the Europeans came and, uh, and claimed the land of their own. I say unceded with several nuances behind it in that the land was not given willingly in that the land has been a place and a space for, for providing food, for providing shelter, for providing nourishment, water, for people to share. Um, and it's important to recognize that this land was not freely given. And, and the fact that it is not meant to be owned, but again, shared. These indigenous tribes were here sharing the resources, the bounty uh, that this earth provides. I also want to acknowledge the locations of some of our uh, panelists today. And I'm, I apologize because I didn't uh, get everyone's location, but Samit in Philadelphia is on unceded land for the Lenny Lenape and Tiffany in New York City uh, is on unceded land for the Muncie Lenape as well as several other tribes who I don't have time to, to list, but I encourage everyone uh, wherever you're at right now to take a moment. I'm putting in the chat uh, nativeland.ca, which is a map uh, that y'all can access and learn about the indigenous tribes that were once in the areas that you currently live. And I encourage you to spend time learning about these tribes. And, and if you can, try to support the people who are still moving forward and, and trying to preserve these cultures and these traditions. Here in Austin, we have a Lipan Mezcalero medicine woman by the name of Marika Alvarado, who's uh, running the Of the Earth Institute uh, of Indigenous Cultures and Teachings. And uh, I highly recommend you, you check out her website. And she is currently partnering with Will Wilson, an artist, uh, Danae artist, who uh, is featured at an exhibition at UT Austin right now in their Visual Arts Center. And they are preserving medicinal plants as well as highlighting the, the toxins and the way that pollution has affected indigenous tribes in the Southwest. So please take time and educate yourselves about the land that you're living on. And I do request that our ancestors who are around us today take heed and hear the work of our panelists, the words that they have to share with us, the wisdom they have to share with us and to guide us and, and help us through today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Marina. Um, my name is Sona Shaw. Um, I'm the manager at the Asian American Resource Center. And um, I really appreciate you um, grounding us in, in, in doing that because, you know, I think we've all recognized, especially within the last few years, how much um, history isn't being told in, in this country and the way that this country was founded. And especially as me as an Asian American, um, I, I reckon with that too, in the sense of like how we are settlers on this land. Um, so thank you for um, holding that space. Um, I wanna thank everyone for being here. It's, it's amazing to see so many folks are interested in um, archiving and our family histories. Um, Lila Grace, Aisha and I had many discussions about this event and, um, you know, just as Aisha mentioned, it is a very personal um, and healing 
um, way of thinking about our work. And I, and I, I feel so grateful every day that I have the job that I do. Um, but, you know, we wanted to create this hands-on workshop um, really to have the importance of archiving um, more marginalized histories, Asian Americans um, and our family stories. I first became interested in this topic when I was an undergrad. Um, I took a class at UT Austin. It was called Asian Women in Diaspora. And my professor had us do an oral history on an Asian woman and I decided to do it on my mother. And I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see um, just some photographs of what I, I did with my mom. Um, so, Having to do something like this so personal and also for a class was very interesting because I was very intentional in the sort of questions that I was asking. And I learned so much about her experience, you know, being 20, immigrating to the US, not speaking any English, um, being married to a man, you know, my father, who she didn't really know at all. And um, the sort of struggles, but also the ways that in many ways she became so independent um, living here in, in the States. And so this is just a photo of me and my mom in Mexico City. And that was another really interesting thing because my parents traveled a lot when we were younger and took us to places that, um, you know, I was surprised that they, they took us to all these places. Um, and then that's my mom and me in Houston where I was born and raised. And then this is when we were a bit older. Um, but the, the experience of doing that and talking, um, having that, that um, just, just having that moment and being able to ask those questions with my mother, I don't think she would have ever just told me these things on her own. And so um, this experience, um, I ended up doing other, um, recordings of oral histories. I did one with my maternal grandfather in India, and then also a family friend who had to leave Uganda in 1972 due to Idi Amin's expulsion of Asians from that country. And so this was all this history that I had never really known or got to learn through um, my own education and um, even being a college graduate and everything that um, I, I got that from you know, these family stories. Um, so being intentional with these recordings and documenting these stories, I learned so much about my Asian, my Indian, my Gujarati um, background in the diaspora. And so the panelists who I'm really excited that we have here today represent a variety of entities in ways to think about um, archiving our family stories. So we have um, Samit Malik with the South Asian American Digital Archive an organization that has helped me understand the importance of my family stories in the U.S. as a um, South Asian American. And also, you know, they provide excellent prompts for us to think about what things to record as well. Um, we have Sam Vong, a curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., um, our federal government institution that is researching and collecting American experiences. Um, Tiffany Diane So, representing the Asian American Feminist Collective, a group that has produced some remarkable zines. You should definitely check those out online. And they create spaces for political education and identity exploration. And our own Austin local archivist, um, Alan Garcia, who has created the nationally recognized ATX Barrio Archive via Instagram. Um, so my, I want to first ask our panelist if um, they can just spend a few minutes um, describing a bit of what they do and if they have done any personal archiving of their family history, what that experience was like. Um, Samit, maybe you can start it off. Yeah, sure. Sona, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the event. I also want to thank Lila Grace and Aisha for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you. My name is Samit Malik. Uh, as Sona mentioned, I'm the co-founder and executive director of the South Asian American Digital Archive, which is a national organization that works to collect and share stories from the South Asian American community. I'm based in Philadelphia. Um, I wanted to share actually a, a photo album um, that my mom actually brought from Michigan. Michigan is where I grew up. 
Um, my wife and I have a daughter who's almost five years old now. And one of the really special things that my mom did was bring um, a bunch of photographs from when I was around her age to Philadelphia uh, during a visit a couple of years ago. And one of the really magical things about this has been watching uh, my daughter look through these photo albums and kind of see herself and recognize the things that she's doing uh, now in her life uh, and see me doing those same things. I don't think I really, my parents immigrated from India in the late sixties. And so I don't really remember seeing photographs of them as a kid. Um, I, I only the first photographs I saw of them, like Sona was saying, was from the first when they first immigrated to the US, so like their 20, early twenties. Um, and so it's really magical to think about the ways that these photos and these family archives, these family stories can help us see earlier generations uh, living through the same kinds of experiences and recognize ourselves in them. Um, and so that's something that I wanted to share today. Thank you, Sami. Um, and anyone can go next out of, out of our panelists wants to share. I can go next. Thanks, Sam. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Washington, D.C., where we're getting some really beautiful snowfall today. Um, as, as Sona mentioned, I am a curator of Asian Pacific American history at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and I'm at one of, one of the 19 units um, at the Smithsonian, and that unit is the National Museum of American History. Um, and uh, at Amer the American History Museum, I am working alongside um, another colleague, uh, curator, Dr. Theo Gonzalez, to build um, um, and expand our holdings in a, uh, Asian Pacific American history. Um, and the work that we're trying to do is to bring more visibility to Asian Pacific American history and APA communities through research, exhibitions, and public programs. Um, and since coming on board um, um, at the museum in September, 2018, I've been really focused on trying to expand um, and rethink our understanding of the APA diaspora within the United States and also uh, beyond the borders of the United States as well. Um, so in terms of documenting my own family history, I have been doing that, but in kind of a less systematic way than um, how I've been doing it at the museum with other communities, but I have been recording and um, uh, through videos, uh, stories of my parents' migration stories from Vietnam as refugees, um, and also talking to my grandparents who passed away a couple of years um, and trying to learn about their own migration histories from South China to Vietnam. Um, and so that has all been very interesting. I just need to be more systematic about it, <laughs> but it's an ongoing project for me. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, I think sometimes when we do some of this work in our professional lives, it must be harder to do it sort of in your personal um, yeah. life too. Mm -hmm. um, Alan, do you want to introduce what you do? Yes. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you all for inviting me to participate today uh, in this panel. My name is Alan Garcia. I am a staff member at the George Washington Carver Museum and at the Oakwood Cemetery Chapel, which are two museum sites in East Austin operated by the city of Austin. And I also run a community archiving project via Instagram um, called the ATX Barrio Archive, which since 2016 has been all about documenting, sharing, and celebrating the culture and history of Austin's black and brown barrios. And uh, part of my work with the Barrio Archive, I started out sharing some of my family's story uh, as young immigrants from Mexico City in Austin, Texas. Um, and I'll share a family photo of uh, me with the family archivist, my mother, um, at her citizenship ceremony um, in 1996, I believe. Um, so all my experience with family archiving, I credit her with inspiring me to uh, enter this field, 
to work in this field because she kept such a great, uh, I mean, she was so good at organizing all of our family photo albums, our collection of uh, home movies on videotape. Um, so because of her, the items are physically in great shape. Um, but you know, this was the 90s. This was in a time before they were really active on the internet. So uh, going forward, part of my work has been sitting down with her, with my dad to just start sharing it digitally, uh, which some parts has been easy, some parts hasn't. Um, but yeah, so, so far it's it's been fun. Um, you know, I'll speak a little more later about the Barrio Archive and just the experience of working and connecting through social media with other Austin families that have deeper roots in the city than, than my family. Um, and just sharing their stories, you know, uh, adding their stories to the narrative that oftentimes get, get left out uh, in the story of, of Austin's growth. But uh, I really uh, cherish this photo. Um, you know, like we say we've saved everything, obviously her documents, uh, her citizenship documents, but this little flag I'm waving, I grew up with that flag being around my house. And I never really knew what um, the significance of it was. I think that was the only American flag we had in our home, but um, going through photos later, I put it together with my mom. Oh, that was from that ceremony that they were given uh, when they were you know, granted citizenship. So just wanted to share this little a little piece of uh, joy from the family archive. It's a beautiful photo, Alan. Thank you for sharing that. And um, hopefully we'll get to learn some skills from your mom on how to organize <laughs> photographs. Um, Tiffany? Yes, hi. <laughs> I have um, a photo I guess I'm going to share as well, but just to give a brief intro, um, again, I'm Tiffany, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a co-founder and co-leader of the Asian American Feminist Collective. Um, we came together um, in 2017 uh, after the um, 2016 election and the Women's March. Um, just, you know, feeling once again, like women of color were being marginalized in uh, mainstream feminist movements. So, um, and we, like um, Sona mentioned before, we organize and um, uh, we present opportunities for identity exploration and political education, uh, mostly in New York, but since the pandemic, um, very much, you know, internationally or nationally. Um, online. Um, and yeah, I feel like it's just been really important as a collective and as Asian American fe feminists to really like engage in our histories um, and think about how we as Asian American feminists can locate ourselves in the archives um, or just as like a continuation of a lineage of feminists like us, um, since we know that we aren't the first ones to do what we're doing right now. We're not the first people who have been like we're Asian American feminists. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the work that we do um, can sometimes, you know, I, I can get into it later, but can highlight history um, and, you know, talk about it, um, family and, um, and yeah. Anyway, so I'm gonna share my photo, um, which is um, a family photo from Taiwan of my mom, and these are all of her siblings. Um, she comes from a very big family. Um, and I just, uh, and you know, my family is sort of in this like long ongoing slow process of, um, of archiving our, you know, our family or, you know, of kind of like digitizing and, you know, just organizing our family archives, I guess, because they exist, whether or not we like touch them or not, obviously. Um, and um, this was a part of a batch that my mom digitized um, from, you know, borrowing from my, um, from my Taiwanese family, because uh, she, you know, is also invested in it. So it's not just me who's interested in it as well. My mom has definitely been collaborating on it. Um, and, you know, I, I love how I forgot who what um, Alan, you said that your mom was archivist of the family. I liked that because I'm like, mothers really just are, aren't they? <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just, I, I love this because it, there's just so much power in this image. And um, I kind of like, 
you know, it, I feel like the reason why we do look into our archives and into our histories is to feel this sense of belonging, right? That especially as um, Asians or um, non-white people in the diaspora who really want to just kind of like locate ourselves whenever we feel alone um, in something that's kind of larger than us. Um, so that's usually our community, our families. Um, and just, you know, our broader, our broader communities of like Asian Americans across the US. Um, so I will stop sharing that um, and pass it on to whatever is next. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I love, I, I have a ton of black and white photos of my, my parents and stuff, and they're just so touching in that way. Cause, uh, and, and I think what Samit said earlier too, of just not seeing photographs of our parents when they were younger, but you see these like, you know, when they're young adults sort of, um, it's amazing. And the, a lot of what you said about your feminist collective, I think that class that I took Asian women diaspora really opened me up into sort of other Asian representations. And this was like in the, in 2000. So sort of before so much stuff was on the internet, but um, that's pretty amazing. Um, so the next, um, you know, the next thing I just want to ask is sort of what um, specific projects you're working on. And um, Alan, if you could um, start us off again, I think pretty, um, you know, what you've done with um, the ATX Vario archive on Instagram is really fascinating. And um, I don't know, it makes us makes us all seem like we could do something like that. <laughs> but I know it takes a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, it's just seems like it keeps growing and growing. Um, the community archiving that's just building, uh, the community archive that's, that's being built on Instagram because uh, in addition to me sharing every now and then stuff from my family's collection, um, because my mother kept so much um, and documented so much, uh, from their life as young immigrants in the city. Um, I just really, you know, wanted to, to present that view of Austin that I feel like is rarely represented. At least me growing up, you know, I never really saw it represented in the news or, you know, local history books. Uh, our museums are, have gotten better, I'll admit, but like that was just a view that was not uh, being shown at the time. Um, so in addition to me bringing personal stuff, uh, it's been great that I've been able to meet a lot of families online, uh, folks that have been here for generations. I mean, have been here like since the 1890s who can trace their uh, family history to a lot of the pockets of uh, Black and Latinx neighborhoods in downtown Austin that are currently occupied by the federal buildings or just other you know, entertainment districts, but um, they can trace their roots to the old, old barrios of, of the city. And it's been great because they, uh, they've reached out and with the same sentiment that, you know, um, they feel left out from the stories of Austin's growth. And um, another part of it, so in addition to receiving submissions from, uh, from families in Austin, I do a lot of archival research in you know, uh, institutional repositories, either on campus or with the city. And uh, I just enjoy searching for those little slices of, of life, you know, from these communities that it may be an advertisement for a business or it may be just photos of, from a newspaper of children playing basketball uh, at an East Austin park. Um, and it's been great to experience people online reconnecting with family history from these archives that they never knew existed. Um, so I get comments a lot from people who request, you know, personal copies of some of these scans because they never knew that their grandfather's photograph was uh, preserved, you know, uh, at UT Austin in one of their archives. Um, and they do a great job of immediately uh, identifying people in these photos, um, whether it's like an album cover of a, a gospel group or a Tejano band. Uh, it's, it's just great to see that, you know, a lot of these, these uh, family members, descendants are, are still here, 
you know, that we could still connect with them. Um, and for the folks that, you know, have been displaced and have moved away, uh, I think we're all aware that there's been a lot of displacement uh, going on in Austin. So a lot of times people aren't living in these communities anymore. Uh, they're out of state or they're just farther north, you know, uh, on the edges of the city. But um, yeah, it's just wonderful to, to reconnect with them um, and share that family history. So it, it just keeps growing The you know, the people reach out wanting to, to participate. So um, I'll, I'll have a little more gems to, to share later in, in the workshop with Aisha. Thank you. And someone asked in the um, chat here, do you back up the Instagram photos and or archive them offline? Um, just like in my hard drives, really, you know, I've been wanting to explore that more with folks. It's just the best way. Um, cause yeah, it's a mix, you know, of things that I scan, um, photos that people send me and really before the pandemic, I was trying to reach out to folks and just do in-person meetups to get a better quality scan of their photos rather than just like iPhone sharing. Um, so it is, you know, um, but it can be better. I'll admit, you know, that's something that I need to work with other archive colleagues, um, to, to figure something out. Thank you. Um, and I think your comment about just the, the sort of, um, rapid sort of displacement of people that were, you know, especially we see in Austin and many of these other cities, I'm from Houston. And so, um, being able to document those stories and how people can connect to that place of where they grew up, because all of that's going away. <laughs> so many ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Samit, do you, you go next? Yeah, Talk about course. a specific projects or things that you're, you're working on. Certainly. Um, so just as a reminder, I'm Samit Malik. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the South Asian American Digital Archive. And I think like Alan said, and I think like a number of others have already said today, uh, a lot of the work that we do, I think most of us probably on this panel comes from recognizing an absence, something that was missing from the archival record, from the historical record, and wanting through our work to be able to change that. Uh, SADA is very much that. Uh, we started SADA 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago now, recognizing that South Asian American stories weren't being systematically collected or preserved by other institutions, other archives, museums, heritage institutions, and fearing not only that our community stories weren't being heard, but moreover, that they would be lost entirely. Um, and so what I'll be sharing today actually are um, a little bit about the connection between family archives or personal archives and community archives, and how it is that personal and family stories become community stories. I'll start though by just talking more broadly about you know, what archives do and what archives kind of think of as their responsibility. Um, you know, as individuals, probably what brought us all here today is thinking about our own personal archives or family archives, photographs, birthday cards, letters, uh, objects that are meaningful to us and that we've held on to because we recognize that they have enduring value to our lives. These are objects that help us understand a particular moment in our lives or a loved one or help us explain something about ourselves to someone else. Um, like I was sharing with our, our photo album um, and my daughter, or help us remember a particular moment in our own lives. But what archivists do is uh, try to identify materials that have the similar kind of enduring value for understanding communities and cultures and societies. And I think the real magic happens in that collaboration between individuals and, and families and archivists, um, where these, these stories, these personal families stories become community stories. So I wanted to share a couple of examples of that. I'll share my screen now. Um, from Sada's work. But I wanted to start by just really um, reiterating that these stories are only available because individuals recognized and valued their own personal and family stories and worked to actively and personally preserve those histories. So the first story that I wanna share with you is that of Kala Bagai, uh, who you see here in this photograph. And Kala Bagai immigrated with her husband and their three young sons to the United States from India and in, from British India um, in 1915. And they came to the US during a period of very restrictive immigration policy and heightened xenophobia and racism that has a lot of parallels with what we are seeing today. 
it was very, very difficult for South Asian women to immigrate to the United States at that time because of this very restrictive immigration policy. And so it was such a big deal that, that Kala Bagai was able to come to the United States that there was a newspaper article about her arrival in San Francisco, uh, as, which is what you're seeing here titled, Nose Diamond, Latest Fad Arrives Here from India. So um, we're, we've been very fortunate to be able to work with Kala Bagai's granddaughter, Rani, to digitize and include the stories from her family, her grandparents and parents in Sada. And this is a story that first came to the archive because of the work of a historian, Erica, Erica Lee, um, who got in touch with Rani, realized that there was a really valuable archive that would be relevant to the South Asian American community and connected her with us. And so a few years ago, we worked with her to be able to share her family story through Sada. I wanted to um, share with you actually some of the things that we've been able to create in, in collaboration with Rani from her family story. The first of which actually is uh, Rani elaborating on her family, family's own story uh, through a get out the vote video that we made last year where she talks about what her family endured during their early days in the United States and how that was relevant to, to us today. Um, and this is a, a video that I meant, as I mentioned, that was made before the last um, election in November. And so I wanted to play, it's a couple minutes long, I'll just play that for you now. Why does your vote matter? Well, allow me to tell you a story. This is my family. My grandparents came here in search of a better life for themselves and their three sons, including my dad. They arrived in San Francisco just over a hundred years ago in 1915, but it was a time of xenophobia and racism, particularly against those from South Asia, like my family. Shortly after my grandparents arrived, Congress passed a new law banning South Asians from coming to the U.S. But my grandparents were lucky. They were here together. They bought a home and started a business. In 1921, my grandfather even achieved his dream and became an American citizen. But just two years later, his dream was shattered. In 1923, the Supreme Court made it illegal for South Asians to be American citizens. My grandfather's citizenship was nullified and he was left without a country to call his own. This destroyed him, and sadly, a few years later, he took his own life. In a letter he left behind, he wrote, I came to America thinking, dreaming, and hoping to make this land my home. I established myself and tried to give my children the best American education. But they now say, I am no longer an American citizen. Now, what am I? What have I made of myself and my children? We cannot exercise our rights. Is life worth living in a gilded cage? It was more than 20 years later before the laws were changed, and South Asians, including my dad and my grandmother, could finally apply for American citizenship. This is why voting matters. I hope my family's story is a reminder of what we've endured to get the rights we have now, how easily they can be taken away, and how hard it is to win them back. If you haven't yet, please register to vote right now. And please, please vote in November. I wanted to share this story in particular because, um, you know, almost all of the materials that you saw in the video were materials that Rani has held on to that she inherited from her grandparents and from her father and that she's taken care of in her own home archive for many, many years until we connected with her and were able to make them available online. And those materials, I think, in, in very tangible ways are changing the world. Um, you know, not only was that Get Out the Vote videos viewed almost 100,000 times, but actually recently, community organizers and activists in Berkeley um, were able to use materials from the archive to make the case for the renaming of a street in downtown Berkeley in honor of Kala Bagai. And actually, um, just in a week or a week and a half, um, we'll, there will be a dedication ceremony um, to rename uh, Kala Bagai Way in downtown Berkeley. This is a banner that was just put up a couple days ago uh, in honor of Kala Bagai's memory. And, and you can see this is how it is in the archive and this is it ha how it is on the streets. Um, and so in very tangible ways, these family archives are changing the way that people will see the world. And if you'd like, um, the, it's obviously online because of the pandemic, but the dedication ceremony will be on Thursday, February 11th. And so it's open to anyone. We're having a parallel watch party. Um, so if you got to go to sada.org slash Kala Bagai Way, you can join us um, for that event. Another story that I want to share with you from the archive is from um, someone named Sharanjit Singh Dillon, who arrived in Oklahoma in 1959 to, to attend university. 
um, part of this, you know, kind of pre-wave of pre pre nineteen sixty five wave of a very small number of individuals from South Asia, primarily who were coming to pursue education here in the United States. And fortunately for us, um, Sharanjit Singh Dillon was a very avid home movie taker. He basically from very early on in his time in the United States would capture home movie footage of himself and his family. Later on, he had children and they moved to California. Um, and so he just took these silent home movies um, that are just beautiful. This is, you can see his wedding ceremony. That's his wife who's entering the frame right now. So once again, you know, thinking about how, these, how we bring these stories and these archival materials to life, a couple of years ago, we worked with a young um, South Asian American musician, Zane Alam, who created a uh, soundtrack to these home movies. Zane grew up in Georgia outside of Atlanta, and he really connected with these home movies in the archive for a couple of reasons. One was because um, it's so rare, of course, to see home movie footage of South Asians in Oklahoma from the 1950s. But the other was that he saw a lot of himself, you know, in these very mundane moments of life, you know, kind of birthday parties and playing outside in the yard, he really recognized himself in his own story uh, in those home movie um, videos. And so he then created a soundtrack, a really moving soundtrack to these home movies. I'm gonna play just a minute of that now to give you a sense of it. But in addition to the soundtrack, Zane also interspersed um, newsreel footage of anti-Sikh and anti-South Asian violence, really trying to make the case through his edited uh, piece of the promise of a tolerant and inclusive um, America that Sharanjit Singh Dillon and other immigrants like Zane's parents came here for and the ways that that promise hasn't been kept. So I'm gonna share, like I said, just a minute of that with you now. Once again, I'll just end by saying that, you know, by doing the work of preserving our personal stories and family stories, we're actually doing the work of changing the world in ways that perhaps we won't even be able to anticipate, um, as you can see through these two examples. So I'll end with our website, sada.org. All the stories and materials that I've shared are freely available to the public there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samip. Um, that just like really motivated me to get a lot more stuff done now. Uh, thanks. <laughs> And just such powerful stories. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Sam, do you want to go? Sure. Yeah. So, Samib, I just want to say those the voting video is beautifully done. <laughs> and um, it's amazing to see how family histories can really come to life. I'm very inspired by the kind of work you guys are doing. Um, so I just want to talk about... Um, what, one, one project in particular that I've been working on um, that focuses on um, really rethinking Asian migration um, and APA diaspora from the lens of thinking about the Americas and not just the United States. So maybe really quickly, I, can, I, I would like to talk about what I'm, I'm doing as a curator um, of Asian Pacific American history at the museum, because oftentimes um, I think people who didn't grow up with museums often don't know what we do. So maybe this is the opportunity to kind of slightly pull the curtains back a little to, um, to talk about what it is really I do as a curator. Um, so one of the many things I do as a curator is try to build um, our our collections and specifically my focus on is on Asia Pacific American collection, uh, the APA um, uh, collection. 
and um, and and uh, and so what I've been trying to do is expand our existing collection of artifacts, and that refers specifically to the physical objects um, in our museum. Um, so this requires identifying the gaps in our collections related to APA communities and how to and how to fill in those gaps. And in my view, I think collecting objects and building a rich collection of both archival materials and three-dimensional artifacts is foundational to the museum's work um, because it's really kind of these physical objects that determine the kinds of exhibitions that we can create, um, uh, that the exhibitions and public programs that we can create at the museum, um, as well as the kind of stories that we can tell. Um, because so much of the engagement, our, the museum's engagement with the public is through physical objects and things. Um, and because we're a brick and mortar museum, there's, there's, there's a, a really a great emphasis on exhibiting America's past through material culture. So in this context, one of my goals as a curator of APA history has been to expand both the temporal and geographical scope um, of the histories of APA di diaspora, diaspora beyond the borders of the United States. Um, and maybe the, the word beyond is a little too abstract uh, because in many ways we're always engaging with borders, uh, with borders, whether we're talking about it within, across, through borders. Um, and so, um, oh, uh, what I've been trying to do um, is, is collect materials of Asian, Asian communities um, in Latin America. <clears throat> now, Asian immigrant mi migration and circulation of goods from Asia um, has a long history dating back as far as the 16th century, right, with the, be the beginning of the Manila galleon trade. Um, and I won't be able to delve into kind of that history in such a brief amount of time here, given, given the amount of time uh, I'm allotted. But there's a significant and vibrant history of Asian communities across uh, Latin America since the 16th century, um, but especially beginning in the 19th century. And these histories have been very well documented and written about by historians and other academics. And what I've been trying to do um, is to try to find ways to invite various audiences to engage in this innovative and important scholarship. And I've been doing this by collecting objects that I think are telling compelling stories about migration, community formation, everyday life. Um, and I've been doing this through family histories. So back in 2019, um, I worked, on, I collaborated on um, an exhibit um, that was commemorating the 105th, uh, uh, 150th anniversary of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And one of the event um, participants um, connected me, wh whose father was actually an ancestor who helped to build the railroad um, of Chinese descent, had connected me to um, other Chinese descendants, uh, other Chinese uh, community members who had descendants uh, who settled uh, before the 1950s and in the 19th century. And they connected me to um, two brothers um, whose father um, named Edwin Lin had served in World War II. And at this time, I originally was really interested in not only documenting Chinese descendants who worked on the railroad, but also um, Chinese Americans who, who were uh, uh, Chinese American vets during World War II. And so I contacted these two brothers, I'm gonna call them the Len brothers in summer of 2019. And we finally arranged to meet uh, sometime in August, 2019. And maybe I'll pause here and ask, um, and ask uh, Lila Grace to queue up, the, queue up the PowerPoint I've prepared. Thank you. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. And so I was originally, thank you, Lila Grace. So I was originally interested in collecting objects of Chinese American vets during World War II, of which we, our museum has many objects. Um, and, it, and this, what, what we call a look-see visit at this donor's home in New Jersey 
opened up an unexpected connection to a Chinese family who had immigrated to Cuba. So the slides you see here are, um, uh, the big photo is of the two brothers, Victor and David Len, and I visited them in August, 2019 at their home. Um, and all the kind of materials that you see are um, stuff that they collected after their father passed away. Um, uh, and so what you see on the table are videotapes of trips to Cuba, family albums. On the upper right hand corner is a box of letters that were written. Um, their correspondence between um, the Len brothers' mother, Aurora, and the father while he was in the China, um, Burma, India theater during World War II. Um, and below that, you'll see that they've labeled this folder called Cuba Family, which um, they had discovered um, in their attic while they were, they were compiling all this, uh, the, while they're trying to gather all this um, uh, documents of their family. Um, and below is another big uh, uh, storage box of more materials. And really there are about, I'd say seven or eight of these containers of just family documents and objects that um, the brothers had gathered in their home. Some of which they, um, uh, some of which they had been organizing for many years. And it's just amazing how um, well documented they, uh, uh, well documented their family history was. So the connection was that, um, so, so let, let me um, talk a little bit about the connection between um, this Chinese American family in Cuba to the United States. So the connection was that Edwin Len, who is the subject of, of most of these materials, he, his family immigrated from China to the United States and he married a Chinese woman named Aurora Alay, who was born and raised in Cuba. Her father, Felipe Tanale, immigrated from Southern China to Havana, Cuba sometime in the 1910s. And Aurora Le was born in 1922 and she would later leave Havana for school um, to the United States in the late 1930s to Ada, Ohio. And there she met Edwin Lin. Um, they had a beautiful and lengthy courtship and they finally married in 1944. Um, so, uh, Lila Grace, can we, we go to the next slide here? So what you see here um, are some photos I took of the objects during my, my look-see visit. And we call it a look-see visit because it's an opportunity for curators to travel out to either communities or people's homes or on sites to see if um, there are historical artifacts or, uh, that we, we would consider uh, collecting and accessioning into um, the museum's collections. And so this, of course, um, looks see visit like uh, uh, yielded these amazing objects that, that we ended up accessioning in our archive center. So what you see, um, I'm sorry, it's very small here, but what you see are photo uh, these are family photo albums um, that Aurora Lay, the mother, had stored um, and saved. And these uh, photographs all document um, her growing up um, in Havana, Cuba. And, so, and they also include photographs of, um, uh, of the restaurants that they opened and other businesses that they began in Havana, Cuba, as well as uh, photographs of members of other Chinese, uh, 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 of, of families uh, uh, within the Chinese community in Havana, Cuba. Um, so in addition to these photo albums, there were also letters that Aurora Lay, Lay kept, um, as well as other um, um, other very seemingly kind of mundane, banal documents that really give us a window into um, life of Chinese um, people in Havana, Cuba. So on the bottom of, of those two uh, photos, 
is actually a lotto ticket from her grandfather um, that she kept. Um, and so her grandfather was really into <laughs> um, uh, the lotto. And it was, uh, in many ways, the way the Br Lynn brothers described it is that it's kind of a national pastime and people engaged in it. it um, and so they kept this lotto ticket as, uh, or her Aurora LA kept this lotto ticket as a memento of her uh, family's history and her, her grandfather. Um, so these uh, materials um, of uh, Aurora LA really tell the history, I think, of a diaspora of the Chinese diaspora that goes beyond the kind of more familiar history that we hear about or read about um, uh, uh, of Chinese American migration to the United States, right? Um, the, I think the, historic, the historical significance and beauty of this collection is that it carefully documents um, migration from Southern China to um, uh, settlements in, in in um, Havana, Cuba, uh, of a group of an ethnic group um, who has uh, historically faced uh, restriction, uh, racism, um, uh, exclusion from uh, migrating in different countries, specifically in the United States. Um, this, uh, these photographs also document um, Aurora Lay's migration to the United States where another chapter of her story um, begins. Um, and like Grace, can we move to the next slide? I'll try to wrap, wrap up this uh, here and I won't go into all the specifics um, of this history because um, since the, the closure of the museums in March uh, of last year, I haven't had uh, much access to these materials. So I'm intentionally being vague about some of this um, because um, we're, uh, I'm still working with the Len brothers on reconstructing some of these migration narratives um, uh, within their family. So, um, so during World War II, so the, first of all, Aurora Lay, um, just as a reminder, she left uh, Cuba um, in 19, around 1939 um, and went to school in Ada, Ada, Ohio, where she met Edwin Lynn. Um, um, and so they married in 1944 and during World War II, Edwin Lynn uh, was sent to Burma to help the United States construct infrastructure and, railway, uh, and railways in Burma um, during the China, uh, Burma, India theater. Um, and the, so the US military uh, referred to the theaters in China and Southeast Asia as a CBI and Edwin Lynn, Lynn had served um, in the Flying Tigers, right? The Flying Tigers was a nickname for the first American volunteer group of the Republic of China Force, which included pilots from the United States Army, Air Corps, uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, so, um, uh, so the other chapter, I think within this uh, amazing collection called the Len Collection um, is that it documents um, and shows how Chinese Americans during a period um, when, uh, when Chinese exclusion was lifted, um, really uh, 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 tried to demonstrate um, their, their sense of belonging um, and tried to use the US military as an avenue to obtain citizenship, right? After a long period of, of Chinese restrictions and exclusion. And so just to sum up here, I think the beauty and historic, historical significance of this fa particular family history is that it opens up so many fascinating avenues of research, as well as new ways to examine the Asian diaspora across Americas. Um, through this family history, we're able to highlight and amplify um, transnational connections between geographical places like Southern China, Cuba, and the United States. And we're also able to trace um, the movements of Chinese Cubans and the migration patterns from Cuba to Southern China, right? Because uh, within actually Aurora's story is that she, in the 1920s and 1930s, 
um, travels back to China uh, for a period and then com comes back to Cuba. Um, so this particular collection, archival collection, this particular family history really expands our geographical and temporal framework um, of APA history. Um, and now we can share it with the general public <laughs> when they're able to come out to uh, Washington DC and um, they can explore it at the Smithsonian's um, Archive Center in the American History Museum. So, and I will, in the interest of time, I will stop there and then pass it on to Sona. Thank you. You're muted. Thank you, Sam. Um, I was going to say um, you should read the comments or the chat feed because it seems oh. like everyone really appreciated just this migration his history and just what you said about, you know, we, we, we don't see all of these um, routes that sort of people are going and living and then, you know, coming and settling here in the United States. Yes. Um, I also just want to make it known, you know, with the Smithsonian, um, it, it being kind of symbolic that you have this role, right, um, in, in our government. And I, I think about this with the Asian American Resource Center being a city of Austin facility to as well, just this kind of inclusive, diverse America, right, that um, yes. we are trying to highlight in these histories. So thank you. Yes. Thank you again. I'm, I'm so happy you're here. Um, and I know we, we don't have so much time left because I know Alan and Aisha are going to be doing a workshop, but our last um, speaker is Tiffany. And if you have any questions for any of our panelists, feel free to just um, put them in the, in the chat. And so Tiffany. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm going to try to go quickly, but um, yeah, I'm really thankful for uh, spaces like this, I think, and I think everyone who RSVP'd is also really thankful for a space like this um, to discuss our histories in the archives um, because we have so often seen ourselves erased from or excluded from them. Um, I know that I, for one, I didn't mention it before, um, grew up in Texas and um, I lived in Austin as well before I moved here to New York. Um, but I, I know that, you know, we learned like a little bit about maybe like the um, Chinese who built the railroad, but other than that, there wasn't much. And I was really grateful as well for the few Asian American studies classes that I was able to take at UT um, that were really what opened me up to um, Asian American like feminist writers um, like Helen Zia and um, Maxine Hong Kingston and uh, Jessica Hagdorn, and I feel like I, um, I feel like it isn't fair though, right, for people who have access um, to higher education, right, or access to institutions to be the only ones who get to have access to those archives. And so I think I'm really grateful um, for folks on this panel like Alan who make it um, accessible, right, to the public who bring uh, the archives into these like cultural spaces that people are actually occupying. Um, because, you know, most of us aren't, right, like physically in the archives or um, allowed to write or like part of an institution or an academy who um, that has archives. Um, so, yeah, just to talk a little bit about some of the projects that um, AFC engages in anyway, um, with um, history and the archives. Hold on, let's see. I'm just going to share a screen. All right. Um, yeah, so um, some of the projects that we do across social media um, are, you know, meant to also engage in history and family archives specifically. Um, for example, we do a series on Instagram with the hashtag, this is Asian America, where we invite um, community members to send us um, photos from their own family archives and stories to share. Uh, on that platform. And, you know, we found that a lot of people really were just so engaging in this because um, it, you know, gave us an opportunity to share these very space where um, we kind of just like collect them on our own and don't have much of a space to talk about them. Um, so I think that's another, you know, that's why we're all here, right? We're all here because we think that our, um, our stories are important to tell. Um, and so we've done that, let's see if I can, 
Um, so we've done that on Instagram. This is one of my co-leaders, um, stories about her uh, parents um, who are Indian, um, but Christian, you know, so that was like a different narrative than we're used to hearing um, here in the States anyway. Um, and then, uh, but then, you know, of course, uh, I also want to point out that, you know, Instagram is also not accessible to all, unfortunately, those without internet or um, access to technology. Um, uh, so we also, you know, find it important to sometimes, you know, come out with some like tangible, uh, you know, free accessible products. Like this is our um, collection of zines that we've created as a collective, um, mostly spearheaded by my co-leader, Rachel. Um, the middle one though, the center one, the second one that we released was How to Make History, where we did dig into, um, you know, just kind of like family histories, um, you know, Asian American stories, like, you know, just any, like we, we just kind of like highlighted um, different community members' um, contributions, like whatever they wanted to talk about. So some people had um, more, you know, like essays, some people had, um, just like family stories to tell anyway. Um, so yeah, we're always trying to just kind of like inject that into the conversation still. Um, and another thing that we do is workshops as a group. Um, the first time we actually ever held a digital workshop, it was at the um, very beginning of, you know, the COVID uh, outbreak in the US. And um, we were doing a, uh, exhibition that I luckily got to help curate and wrote the text for at Wing Luke Museum in Seattle, um, which is another awesome like Asian institution. Um, and uh, our the so the um, workshop that we did was on Asian American history in action, and it's one that we do where we bring in. Um, different, you know, like feminist influences that we've had in our lives. We just invite people to think about, um, you know, where they came into their feminism and um, who influenced it, you know, what were some of the role models that you had, um, be it, you know, um, pop culture icons, right? Or um, writers and scholars, or sometimes it was family members. Uh, and so I thought it was really interesting, Sona, that you mentioned in your um, ethnic studies class, right? Um, your Asian American studies class that you presented on your mother because um, as you know, Asians in the diaspora, a lot of times we don't have those figures, right? We weren't like paraded with figure with, you know, other Asian American feminist leaders constantly because <laughs> that wasn't the representation that we had as like a small minority. Minority. Um, and so in this workshop, though, I uh, typically present on Helen Zia, who, you know, I was lucky to learn about at my in my ethnic studies class. Um, but, you know, another person that I also like to add to it whenever I give this workshop alone is my mom, um, because, you know, I do have her to thank for, um, you know, obviously where I am today, just being here um, as like an unapologetic um, Asian American feminist, um, being able to like present this to all of you, you know, I have her to thank. She's been like formidable, obviously, and um, forming who I am today. Uh, so I find it really important to um, pay her homage, homage. Um, and yeah, so in that workshop, though, you know, we invite people to like, think about the people who have shaped their political identities, um, and how these figures have like inspired them to take action. And um, a lot of times other people also presented on family members of theirs, because they, um, you know, similarly didn't have Asian American feminist figures in their lives growing up, um, besides their family. Um, and so yeah, that's another thing that we do. Um, and let's see, at the end of the workshop, um, we like to also offer resources. Um, shout out to South Asian American Digital Archive is one of them, but um, other, you know, like accessible or quote unquote accessible um, Instagrams, right, are like the 1721 women on Instagram um, who highlights just like different Asian women. Um, throughout history um, and then brown history, um, which is more in the South Asian like diaspora um, and then Densha, which is also in Seattle. Um, they have a lot of rich, you know, archive on like uh, Asian American activism and um, the Japanese internment camps um, or concentration camps. Um, and then also a uh, different Asian American timeline. Um, AATimeline.com is a really cool resource um, because it just kind of 
goes through a, um, American history through this Asian American lens, um, which is also something that, of course, we weren't really presented with. Um, and so I find it, you know, I, I, I think it's awesome that so many people have joined here today, and I'm sure we'll um, watch this in the rerun, um, because I think that, you know, it is really important for us to continue um, inserting our stories, right, into uh, the, like, American story and how that is actually um, it's not such a clean story, right? It's it's very complicated. There's so many of us. We represent so many different identities. Um, you know, we're not just uh, the Chinese American railroad workers. We're also, you know, brown, Muslim, you know, queer, trans. Like there are just so many um, uh, untold histories and so many marginalized identities that um, don't really get the same um, the same kind of uh, you know equal. I guess, yeah, whatever time, right? We don't get to like spend a lot of time learning about these. So we have to kind of take it, take that um, responsibility on our own. And it's and it's our job to like do it, which is why um, it's important for us to keep on engaging in these spaces and um, for hopefully making them accessible too. So, you know, thank you for making this a free, um, a free workshop for people um, and for, you know, kind of like sharing this institution, this institutional knowledge um, with, the broader public. Um, and I will yield my time. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tiffany. I think that's a perfect segue to Alan and Aisha actually talking more about hands-on on, you know, how to start. So I'm going to spotlight you guys. Thank you, Sona. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. It was wonderful to learn more about your work and see all of these beautiful archival images. It was a really great framing conversation on the importance and the different ways um, our family archives can be used on different, uh, different scales. So now that we're all feeling really inspired to start gathering our family archives, how do we get started? And so for this last segment of the event, Alan and I are gonna share some practical preservation considerations that can help guide you uh, throughout the process. And we may have a little time at the end for questions, but don't forget, we also have some archivists monitoring the chat that can help uh, answer questions along the way. And so I thought I'd start by uh, asking you, Alan, um, a lot of times the people that I talk to, family members that I work with at the History Center, Sometimes just getting started is the hardest part. It can be overwhelming. Sometimes it can be really emotional to think about gathering your family history. You know, sometimes there's intergenerational trauma, I think, especially when you're talking about uh, communities of color and their archives. So since the beginnings of ATX Barrio archive is kind of tied to your own family history and starting your own family archive, and probably learning a lot from your mom, I thought maybe you could just share a little bit about how you first started getting, how you first started and maybe some concrete steps that you would recommend for folks to, to try. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I have always approached it by starting at the beginning, I guess, of our documented photo albums um, and you know, thankfully my mom was so good at labeling a bunch of stuff. So um, that's how I've approached even just starting to choose what to digitize. Um, so I've always wanted to keep the original order of that. Um, just for example, like all of our family albums are labeled with dates. Um, so I've just tried to keep that intact the way that it was scrapbooked and kept um, by my mom. And with photos, I mean, it is daunting to um, just to try and like capture all the big stories because they documented so much like their, just their first experiences uh, in this country, right? So because a, a lot of uh, stuff is familiar to me through just their storytelling, uh, I had started by taking note cards and just photo by photo, trying to get the photos that I didn't know who was who, right? There's so many photos of just the kitchen staff, these group photos of cooks, bus boys. Um, and it's people that I just can't recognize, but they still have the memory of it. Um, 
So just even with starting with a note card and helping collect that metadata, right? Like who's who? I know this is my father, this is my uncle, but who, who else is in this photograph? Um, and then I can start to link it to these big stories of like their coworkers who, you know, passed away because of AIDS or their coworkers who were local musicians in Austin uh, and went on to record and have a music career, but um, tie it back, I guess, to, to our family photo album. Um, then I should mention my parents are separated too. So I have to sit down with them individually because they tell different stories, you know, it's, it's not easy to <laughs> get the, the right story. Um, so that's been like the, the biggest first step of like taking time to sit down with, with one side of the family and then, and then the other. Yeah, and I think it's important to realize that it does take a lot of time and um, mm -hmm. time is a resource that, you know, you know, sometimes can be limited when you have your own lives. Like I'm lucky that I, my job is to do archiving, but I, I still have limited time to focus on my family's archives. So you don't need to have all of the materials and resources all at once to do a perfect job. I think um, just starting with what you have, um, even if you have one family member that you can talk to or one set of photographs that you can look at, um, that's still taking one really important step to preserving your family history. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the materials um, that you've kind of used in your family archiving process? I know digitization is like a huge um, piece that we've talked about and making it accessible through social media. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some like accessible tools? Cause you know, sometimes scanning equipment can be hard to find or get in touch with. Right, yeah, I mean, it's hard to get my family to, I guess, get used to just scanning the physical items other than just, it's so common for us to use WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, just to share copies of photos, you know, photos, uh, photographs that are taken from an iPhone. Um, so, and also just, I think like navigating basic phone, like proper photo techniques, um, which I'm sure we're all familiar with when we're together with family taking photos. Sometimes the technology can be clunky. So that's just something I've helped them out with. Um, Cause I do have a lot of family in Mexico still who lived part of their lives in Austin with us. But all those memories that uh, we captured on film or um, um, in photographs has stayed here in the US. So just a way to disregard borders, right, and share that history with them. Yeah, we do engage on social media a lot. Um, so just to get the best quality, really, it's of a photo to send to them, like via WhatsApp or Facebook. In the absence of a scanner, yeah, I just try and like work on lighting issues, how to frame a photo. Um, but I'm slowly getting them used to just the importance of investing in like, I've brought my Epson photo scanner to their house just to start making digital copies because we love to touch things, right? We love to handle the original photos and pass them around and hold them up to each other and like compare baby photos which is great, but you know, you can see the, you can see the traces, right? The fingerprints. Um, so just having the conversation about like, it's okay to do that, but let's have a protective layer, right? Um, we can still do this kind of photo sharing interaction, but it can be digitally, we can get used to that. Um, but it's, uh, it's a task, <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah, and I, I am sad for, well, so, for so many reasons, but typically if our libraries were open, some of our public libraries do have scanning equipment. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you're not living in Austin, um, reaching out to your public library or maybe your historical society or history center, um, they'll be able to also recommend either free or low cost uh, vendors or other resources if you have trouble accessing digitization equipment yourself. That's a great resource. Um, and so I thought that we could end, um, wrap up the workshop by each of us sharing um, just a few images from some of the family collections that we work with and um, 
just also giving again a couple more tips on dealing with uh, physical preservation. Um, so I'm going to share my screen really quick. Um, and so we only have we have a limited amount of time today. So um, you know we can't cover all the different types of material that might be in your family archive. Uh, the History Center does have some preserving your family history resources, so uh, worksheets on different uh, formats, so please feel free to check that out. Also, after the event, we'll be sen uh, sending out a more comprehensive uh, resource guide with a lot of different archival resources that can help you navigate uh, archiving your family history. Uh, let's see. Um, but I wanted to start by sharing um, just a few images from the types of items that are found in the Singh family papers held at the History Center. Uh, Zhou Singh was a Chinese immigrant who came to Austin in the late 1800s. And he married a Mexican-American woman named uh, Frances Moreno, who was living in Austin. Um, after the two were married, uh, they lived in East Austin with their four children and they operated a laundromat located in downtown Austin. Um, and so you can see their family photograph in the left image um, that was taken around 1910. Uh, if you have old photographs like this, I would recommend trying to keep it away from sunlight, keeping it in a cool, dry place. That kind of, those kinds of basic practices will reduce fading and deterioration and make them last a lot longer. Um, I know that my father and all my uncles have the same photo that's just like this, all of the siblings with their parents. And so it is a beautiful photograph that you might want to frame and keep on display in your living room. Um, in that case, I think this would be a great candidate for digitization so that you could keep scan, print, and keep the copy of a photograph in a frame while um, protecting the original photograph. Um, in either an archival photo album or something similar. Uh, paper materials like letters um, that you see in the middle could be should be flattened when possible. So try to remove them from their original envelopes. I love old envelopes and the way the stamps looked and the handwriting on the addresses. Um, but try to keep those um, sort of separated and flattened. Uh, you can put them in a there's a PVC free archival a sleeve here. You could just keep it in a folder, um, like a manila folder is would do the trick if you can find one of those at a home office supply store. Um, and also there's, uh, if you have any fragile items, sometimes letters, or you can see this um, publication has some tearing on the cover, try to resist the urge to mend it yourself. A lot of time, uh, household fasteners or scotch tape can do more damage to um, the material than you realize. So scotch tape can yellow the paper over time, rusty paper clips or staples can damage the corners of, your, of those precious letters. So if you see some that are really starting to damage your material, try to take time to remove those. Um, and again, if this publication was newsprint, I would also encourage you to maybe make a photocopy on either archival paper or just other white paper um, because newsprint isn't made to last and can disintegrate over time as well as maybe yellow the papers that are kept in the same enclosure. Um, and again, I love the look and feel of old newspapers and I know how precious it can be if a family member's on the front page or featured in a certain section of the newspaper. So if you want to hold on to that original, maybe just consider keeping it um, isolated from the other materials in your collection, either in its own separate folder or box. You can also buy buffered paper or a buffered sleeve to slip it into to protect it from other items. And I also wanted to show um, this photograph from the Agarwal family papers collection. Because, and we talked a little bit about this that can happen virtually, but it's a great example of the importance of writing down what's happening in the photograph. Um, so you can tell that this photograph was probably mounted on some sort of uh, black construction paper, maybe part of a family album or a scrapbook. This is a good reminder that sometimes those really old photo albums are highly acidic and can cause some damage to your photographs. 
um, it, especially those like really popular cling photo albums with the plastic film over the top of the photos. If they stay in those photo albums for too long, um, that plastic's just gonna remove the image right off of the photo. So be really careful with those. Um, and so they decided to remove it from the photo album um, and put it in an archival sleeve. And then they took a separate sheet of paper and wrote down what was happening, the location, the date, and who was in the photograph. And this information, it does it when you take the photo, you know, it's hard to find the time to just jot that down right in the moment. Um, but that information can quickly get lost over time. And I think like Alan and some others have said, um, this can be a great family activity if you've inherited a photo album, but don't know everyone in the pictures, you can take a quick photo and share it through social media or through WhatsApp. You could even hold it up right now during this quarantine time during Zoom, hold up the photo and um, see if as a family you can identify who and what's happening in the images and then write that stuff down. And then uh, even generations after you will um, know what's happening in the image. And the last item that I'll just share really quickly is the Agarwal um, family collection also had a couple of rare books. So this is a, a book from 1904. Um, if you do have family albums or other, uh, or sorry, family Bibles or other bound publications that are really fragile, make sure that they're being stored upright on a bookshelf. Um, you wanna try to keep all of your archival material off the floor whenever possible. You can see in this book, I see that there are signs of water damage, maybe a little molding. Um, I even see like some pest, uh, pests affecting this book in the corners, kind of seem like they've been eaten away. Um, and this is all um, pretty common or can happen if you're keeping your archives on the floor or maybe in an uncontrolled environment like the garage or the basement or, or an attic. Um, it can uh, make your material a lot more susceptible um, uh, to these kinds of issues. Again, I like understand that space is a resource. Um, and so sometimes you have to keep uh, your material in like not the most ideal situation. But in that case, make sure that it's in a protected, maybe like plastic tub, something that where it's a little more protected from the environment. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that Alan can share a little bit more um, some images that he works with as well. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the story of my dad who is a notorious keeper of all things. Um, he'll save every single receipt from his visit to Walmart to Home Depot. Uh, and for a little, little over two decades now, he's been running a small business. So it just seems to be like collecting uh, every single item related to the business. So it's hard to get him to weed things and just pick what's important. Um, and one thing that was about to get thrown away from our, <clears throat> our collection was uh, a series of receipts that were handwritten. And uh, I pulled them out because I started looking at them and I was noticing these are receipts that my father had handwritten with business uh, after business uh, transactions with a lot of restaurants and nightclubs um, in a part of Austin that is now considered a gentrified area. But I was just so fascinated by the record that this left behind of, you know, who operated a business here. Um, there's just a lot of details in these, what, you know, my parents thought were just mundane receipts with no value. Um, but there's a lot of handwritten details on there. Um, who the business owner is, what the transaction was about. I was often learning that it was because of a soccer event, you know, the World Cup and this business was hiring my dad because they wanted to screen sports, you know, for the Latinx community that, that frequented those, those businesses. Um, so I've been keeping these and just, you know, slowly working with my family about what we can throw away. We don't need to keep all the big box store receipts um, but stuff that's a little more personal that can tell a story about my father's business, um, our place in the city. Uh, I've just been saving those um, and trying to be good about preserving that. And just another item I wanted to share 
from uh, my work at the Carver Museum. Um, when we talk about, see, when we talk about uh, like preserving family history um, and just ways to, um, yeah, ways to prevent the, the decay of some of these items. This is a funeral program from a collection of uh, donated funeral programs from East Austin. And you can see, this is, uh, we all do it where we can cut out uh, newspaper clippings, right? And fold them in some programs for events, in this case, funeral programs. But that um, it doesn't mean we have to stop this tradition, right? This is a funeral program from the 60s, but we can safely do it. There's a way to, you know, keep this practice of folding things. Um, it's just, I, I find it so fascinating that, that we're still doing this with our collections. Uh, but like Aisha had mentioned, we can have a buffer of paper or just some protective layer around it to keep tucking away the obituary clipping from the newspaper um, and tuck it in the funeral program of a loved one, but to make sure we save uh, these documents that they don't end up in the future, you know, being unfortunately damaged like, like this one uh, shows up as. So just small snippets of uh, family collections and preservation. That's great. Um, and I think that might, I know we're running kind of short on time, um, but uh, I think it's just, uh, thank you so much for all of your questions. And um, Alan, did you want to share that last photo? Or... Oh. Photo. Sure, yeah. You mean <laughs> uh, the Mexican American family? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find it. Um, okay, let me try another way. Okay. Yeah, this is a, a photograph from the Austin History Center that's been shared before. Um, really, is just um, as a you know practice and what not to do with photo preservation. Uh, it's from the um, Mexican American subject files, but this photo just always spoke to me. Um, obviously it's very damaged, extremely damaged with tape, thread, photos are cut out, you know, faces are cut out. Um, but it just reminded me of the personal conversations that I have had with family about their practices, you know, and preserving our, our items that, um, just trying to reassure them, you know, it's it's not a sin that they used adhesive on the back of their photos that um, it's not a terrible thing. I just, this, this photo makes me think of how much care was put into it at the time uh, by this family. Um, and I know it's hard to separate that, you know, since we're professionals and we think a lot about the field, but I don't know, Aisha, if this, what this photo, um, how this photo speaks to you and like what, what it says of these communities in the past and communities of color really trying hard to hold on to their items um, the best way they could, right? And with the limited means. Yeah, I, I mean, when you were telling me about this photo, it was so moving to hear you speak about it and recognizing, you know, that archives were not built with communities that look like us in mind and the practices that were developed to keep those histories safe were not created with us in mind. So, you know, to make a way to preserve these histories with whatever tools we had available to us, I think is really powerful uh, and emotional. And I think that that is also worth preserving and having these conversations within our communities first and within our family networks first of the best ways that we want to honor our ancestors, I think is really the first step and what should be prioritized. And then if you, you know, feel like you need to, if you wanna to talk to an ar a professional archivist that that network is out there for you, but this is really for you know, preserving our own stories, the ways that we want to preserve them, not the ways that institutions um, predominantly white institutions tell us to. So I think to always keep 
uh, that in mind while we do this work is important. So thank you so much for sharing all of the important work that you do, Alan, for the city. And I'm so glad that people across the country get to see um, the histories of East Austin because of your work. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you everyone for having me. Pass it on to Pass it back to Lana Grace. And thank you, I know we ran out of time, so, or over time. So thank you for everyone who has stayed with us. Hi everyone, just going to go ahead and spotlight myself. Um, thank you all for joining us. I know we're a little over time. Um, I dropped a couple of helpful links in the chat as well. Um, the AARC social media uh, bi-weekly newsletter where you can stay up to date on AARC programming and events and also our programming survey. As I had mentioned throughout the chat, we will share a full recording of this event uh, later this week, as well as all of the resources shared in the chat as well. Uh, later today, you will receive an email from Eventbrite that will have, again, a link to our programming survey, and then also um, links to all of our panelists, their affiliated uh, programming, and um, the organizations as well. Um, so thank you all again for joining us. I know we're a little over time, but I'm um, glad you spent the afternoon with us and I hope to see you at a future AARC event. All right, thanks so.